Uh, Penny introduced the day with a list of questions that we were asked to consider. Um, and I went away and considered these questions and came up with three questions of my own. And on considering those questions further, I found I had even more questions. So I'm sorry, my presentation is again going to be perhaps one that poses more questions than, than it answers. A few days ago, I had to fill in um, an ethics approval form for a student that I'm supervising. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with what these forms look like. There are two boxes. One says the proposed research raises no ethical issues. The other one says the proposed research raises ethical issues which are set out on the attached application for ethical approval form. Please tick one. Now, this student's project was actually on the ethics of public funding for human enhancement technologies. So it not only raises ethical issues, it is in fact fundamentally concerned with them, with identifying them, analysing them, interrogating them and so forth. But we ticked, no, this project raises no ethical issues because it's not the kind of project that by the way it is carried out by its methods actually requires ethical approval. Um, the student is going to go away and do documentary research and conceptual and philosophical analysis. There are no, there are no human participants, there are no um, engagements of a sort that would require it to be sub um, subjected to ethics approval. I wanted to start with that story because I think it illustrates a point that I want to make about the sort of research that we do. In the first question that I posed, um, which is in my abstract on, on your program today, I draw a distinction between ethics in research, so the sort of issues of social and ethical responsibility that are encountered by researchers, including social researchers, in the course of carrying out their work, and our concern with making sure that research is ethical. So that's on one hand. Um, and on the other hand, research in ethics, in other words, ethics research, which is what I do. So that's the subjects, the methods, the analytical approaches and toolbox, and the outcomes that comprise ethics as a research discipline. We've been concerned so far today mainly with the former, so ethics in research. And I think my task, to begin with at least, is to, um, is to explain the latter, to look at what research in ethics means and does, um, what it is we do, and to discuss how that relates to ethics and research. I think if the question is how, for example, our research methods support and articulate a commitment to social responsibility, I think it's important to point out that the usual methods of what you might call traditional bioethics do not, in fact, raise very many ethical issues. The research subject of our discipline is the set of ethical issues that are raised by other forms of research and, of course, in other contexts. Um, for example, and most notably, medicine and healthcare, although, of course, as we've seen today, it's not limited to just those. I think it's also important to point out, of course, that I referred to traditional bioethics. Bioethics as a discipline is itself undergoing a period of methodological reflection, and there's a real push now to include um, empirical social research methods and disciplinary theories under the umbrella of what we might call interdisciplinary bioethics. And, of course, these will be then subject to the same kinds of issues that we've been talking about. But in terms of the, what, what I call um, sitting, out, sitting at my desk drinking tea, looking out the window and thinking kind of research, there are not that many ethical issues related to the research method itself. Despite the fact, though, that our research is on ethical issues rather than raising ethical issues through its method or through its choice of subject, social responsibility is no less important to us. We call what we do applied ethics or practical ethics. We want it to have some sort of practical effect. So we're not doing ivory tower philosophy here. We want to actually make a difference in the real world. So how does this apply then to the question of ethics with respect to social research methods in particular? Well, when you talk about research ethics in my discipline, usually, most of the time, what you mean is clinical or scientific research ethics. So social research ethics in the past hasn't really been something we think about very much. Um, for example, if you look at the number of papers that are out there on clinical research ethics versus social research ethics, um, it doesn't mean there are none. There are, there are very good papers on social research ethics, but it's a vastly disproportionate number. And in general, there has been quite a disconnect between the ethics research community working in what we call bioethics and those people who are working on the ethics of social research methods. So the, there's not very much, um, much join-up between those two. I think there are many reasons for this. One reason is that um, bioethics or biomedical ethics, if you like, as a discipline grew largely out of firstly medical practice and the ethics of professional medical practice and then later advances in bioscience research. So it's always been very sort of medically and scientifically focused. Another reason of course is that healthcare and medical treatments are very high profile. 
Um, and health and bodily integrity are so fundamental to human welfare in many ways that interventions directly affecting these are perhaps seen as more topical. But of course, and as we've seen illustrated today, the boundaries between medical interventions and social implications are by no means clear cut. There is in fact a trend, as I said, in bioethics now towards incorporating knowledge and methodologies from other cognate disciplines, and that's one way of recognising this blurring of the boundary. How can we talk about, let's say, the ethics of health without drawing on health sociology to examine, for example, how our concepts of health may be socially constructed and how this will then affect our ethical analysis and what we do in practice. But nevertheless, I think it remains true as a broad generalisation that there has been a subject level separation between clinical and bioscientific research ethics and the ethics of social research. However, ethical issues in social research, in a lot of ways, I think, both recapitulate and cast new light on familiar topics from clinical and scientific research ethics. Um, so, for example, David this morning commented on the social relationship between the researcher and the participant, and he flagged up the question of whether research should do good or whether researchers themselves should get involved in doing good in the course of their research. The danger of misconception that participation will lead will lead to rendering aid and so forth. And I think in a lot of ways, to me, that mirrors the tension in clinical research between the clinical duty of care to the patient on one hand and the need to maintain scientific objectivity on the other. So your concern for your research participants versus your concern that the research not be, not be affected by your actions. Um, the misperception about participation leading to aid in some ways mirrors perhaps the therapeutic misconception which can occur during clinical research. So I think one question, and I said I would have more questions than answers, one question that arises in my mind is actually whether the ethical thinking that we've developed in one context could also contribute to ethical discourse in another. So whether our thoughts about how we address and how we try to resolve these issues, these problems with respect to clinical research could somehow inform our analysis of these same issues in social research and of course vice versa. To give another example, I went to, I was lucky enough to go to one of the Methods of Manchester sessions earlier this year, which was on blog analysis, and one of the things that was discussed was the ethics of internet research. And I saw a lot of parallels between this and the ethics of research involving genetic information in terms of privacy, um, anonymity, security of information, and so forth. Um, and I was ha having a look just out of curiosity to see whether there's been any work done that actually links up these two concepts. Um, all I found so far was a paper in, in French, um, in a French journal that I hadn't really heard of before, and since I don't read French, I've been unable to make much sense of it. But what that says to me is that people are not going around all the time saying, let's learn from each other, let's cross over between these. It's really, I think, an underexplored field of ethics research to look at what the synergies are between these two areas. Okay. The second question that I, that, that I asked that's in the abstract is, what's the role of ethics research, in other words, what, what I do, in shaping policy and practice as far as what constitutes ethical research across other disciplines? I think now's the time to say a word about procedural ethics, so ethics committees, the approval forms that I mentioned that we're all familiar with and so forth. What is or what should be the role of these mechanisms in modulating research practice? Um, I thought there was a really good comment earlier about um, how ethics in research is all too often limited to procedural concerns about the study design and does it get through the ethics committee. Whereas what I would argue ethics in research should consist of, and I think this was in line with the comment that was made earlier, ethics in research is obviously much more than that. I think it should be an ongoing and reflexive moral inquiry into the nature and the purposes of research itself. Not just don't do that, but what should you be doing and how should you be doing it? There is nevertheless an important role for ethics committees, but the question is what it is. And I think, as much as anything else, it's partly about keeping public opinion and, and research in step. Um, we had a discussion earlier this morning over coffee about the role of lay participants in ethics committees, and I pointed out that if you are having an expert committee on almost any other subject, let's say um, engineering or an environmental consultation, you specifically wouldn't want general lay people for their lack of expertise. You would be looking to people who actually have some kind of relevant background. So what is the role of the public opinion in terms of modulating the ethics committee's decision? And I think it is partly there to maintain trust in science, to, to keep public opinion side by side with what, what research is doing. I think as far as what ethics research does in terms of ethical research practice, 
I like to think that what we do in some ways is to construct a framework, um, and by that I don't mean the kind of um, set of rules or anything else, but a theoretical framework to think about the issues that are raised by research practice. So making concerns explicit, disentangling competing arguments, developing concepts and arguments that are susceptible of consistent application, those, those sorts of things. And I think that puts then a duty on people who sit on ethics committees and on researchers themselves to be aware of developments in ethical thought and how these might apply to shape their own research methods and practices. So in the same way that I can't necessarily perform an analysis of quantitative sociological data, but I can be aware of the research and I can understand how that shapes my own research inquiry, in the same way people working in the social research field can understand what's done in ethics research and apply that to their own practice. The last point that I raised was about reflexivity and what, what I asked was actually what constitutes um, appropriate reflexive ethical practice. I think there's two sides to this. One is to say what is reflexive ethical practice for researchers and as we said it's clearly not enough just to follow the rules, you can't just fill in the form and say you've done ethics. Um, thankfully of course most of us as researchers are not in that place but um, I have seen this attitude from various people within the research community particularly, um, I have to say, within life sciences. That's my own background, and I certainly know as a life science researcher, the only time the word ethics was mentioned was when I had to fill in that form so I could use some mice. We, we just didn't have that kind, of, that kind of discussion. That was a long time ago, and I think things are changing for, and for the better, but I think we have to be aware that these attitudes do persist in some places. I think when it comes to a consideration of ethics and social responsibility in research, we have, as I said, not only to consider whether we should be doing a particular piece of research, but also ask what sort of research should we be doing? Not just should we do this or not, but what ought we as researchers to do? And I think, again, this mirrors some of the concerns raised by earlier speakers. For example, how do we justify conducting research of any sort, really, in a, in a community when the basic needs of that community remain unmet? What are our priorities? This, in some ways, reflects the search for justifications for blue skies research versus applied research. Should we be devoting all our research spend to, for example, reducing poverty, improving global health, eliminating chronic disease? How do we justify basic research that may have less immediate potential to improve welfare and save lives, but may in the long run be of equal value, perhaps? And again, who's to say what value is, um, but be of value in some way to us? So that's what's reflexive of ethical practice for researchers. What constitutes reflexivity in ethics research? What can we ourselves gain from participating in this discourse with other disciplines over ethics and research methods? How can we integrate the understandings, the approaches, the concepts and insights that we gain from these other disciplines on which we seek to comment? I wonder, in fact, I said quite close to the start of this talk that the methods of traditional bioethics do not really raise any ethical issues in and of themselves. But I wonder actually whether that's true. Are there in fact hidden ethical concerns either with the methods or the chosen subjects of ethics that have heretofore remained or been kept invisible, either deliberately or willfully, maybe as a way of preserving this perception of disciplinary and methodological integrity, or maybe just through a lack of appropriate reflexivity within, within our discipline? I think as far as methods go, bioethics has been traditionally quite bad at considering and reflecting on its choice of methods. And again, this is changing. The incorporation and the mainstreaming of alternative theoretical perspectives is testament to this. But I think we, we certainly could do a lot more navel-gazing about how we do what we do and whether that's how we should be doing it. And as far as subjects goes, I mentioned blue skies science not long ago. I wonder whether there's such a thing as blue skies ethics and how do we justify doing that? By, by which I mean, if, if I think about the last few pieces of research I've done, one's on clinical research ethics protocols and what should be done um, in, in borderline cases, one is about participation in other sorts of research, and one is about the use of enhancement technologies in animals, and that's sort of quite, quite fanciful. So how do I justify, on the one hand, not devoting all of my ethical attention to solving those ethical problems that are going to actually make a huge difference to the welfare of people today? How do I justify go going off and writing about science fiction type speculative technologies applied to animals? Why, why is that the sort of thing we should care about? Well, that's a question that I, I wrestle with myself. Um, should we be obliged first and even perhaps only to turn our attention to the kind of real world problems of practical ethics that are going to have the greatest immediate benefit. 
and how, we, how do we define that benefit? So, as I said, I have more questions than answers, um, but I hope they are useful and the right questions to be asking, um, and I look forward to exploring them further in discussion. Thank you very much.